Planning Committee of Social Development. Um, as you know, um, I'm the chairperson of this um, committee, and I'm now going to ask that the other members of the committee, as well as the officials and the guests, please introduce themselves as well. Good morning, Chair. Member Barranca is here. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and uh, uh, the department and other members. It's Member Mark. Uh, Chairperson, if you can hear me, um, I'm about to get to a court proceeding, so I might leave the meeting in the process and uh, later join the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Member Mpamba Boitka. We can hear you. Okay. Good morning, Chairperson Wendy Philander. Good morning, Chairperson Rachel Van Fuego. Good morning, Chairperson Ricardo McKenzie. Good morning, Chairperson Ayanda Burns. Thank you very much, members. Can we also now ask the guests from the department to also introduce themselves? Good morning, Chairperson. Um, I have uh, joined the team this morning. This is a follow-on presentation from our last uh, committee meeting. I will, though, have to step out as there is an urgent matter regarding a death at a SASA site, so do forgive me if I don't uh, stay for the full duration of the session. But uh, Dr. McDonald is here with the team to do the presentation on our behalf. Um, I will alert you when I do leave if I have to. Thank you, Chair. Dr. McDonald. Thank, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Robert McDonald, Head of Social Development. Um, and I'll uh, ask Mr. Hewu to introduce himself as well as Ms. Khosin. Thank you, Ajode. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson and all Honorable Members and the Minister. I'm Zondi Reu, the Chief Director for Community and Partnership Development. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Leona Fwesson, Chief Director of Social Welfare and Restorative Services. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other uh, guests that need to introduce themselves? Good morning, Chair and Honourable Members. I'm Ananda Nal. I'm the Head of Ministry for Minister Fernandez. Thank you very much, Ms. Nal. I see somebody called Huda. If you could perhaps identify yourself. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Huda Faker. I'm the National Advocacy Manager at Black Sash. Thank you very much, Ms. Faker, and welcome to our meeting. It's always Thank very good to have Black Sash here. Um, we are also joined by our procedural staff, um, our procedural officer, Ms. Lumonde Jamke, whose capable work keeps this committee running, um, as well as support from our WCPP IT colleagues. And we've got um, two of them, both Candice Morris um, and Clarence Issa helping us today. Um, colleagues, as you know, the WCPP has rules for online conferencing, and we ask that all participants are muted at the start of the conference. And if you'd like to engage with the chair, please use the chat function to raise a point of order. Um, or if you don't have that function available, please identify yourself by just telling us who you are. Please use the mic and video function when you do speak, um, as it does help people watching on uh, YouTube identify who you are as well. Um, I'm, I'm now going to ask Namonde, do we have any apologies this morning? We did not receive any apologies, Chair. So the, the only apology members we did receive was from the South African Social Security Agency, SASA. Um, this meeting was initially set up as a follow-up um, to our meeting on the 21st of January where we looked into the support provided for people receiving disability grants 
specifically the backlog in the temporary disability grant, where in the Western Cape there were over 53,000 outstanding applications that needed to be processed by the end of the financial year, which is the end of March. We had Sasa and the City of Cape Town here to tell us about their plans and the crisis. And we also invited our Provincial Department of Social Development to brief us on the food relief programs that they've made available and the support that the department has made available to vulnerable people, especially those living with disability. Because we know where national government has failed, the provincial department has had to step in to um, help support those most vulnerable. Um, we didn't have enough time during that meeting for the department to present, and we've there, thus asked the department to um, come back. So just a bit of background, members. Um, we, we have been trying to engage um, SASA to get the information that we requested um, from our last meeting, and we still have some information outstanding from last year as well. Um, the deadline for that was Monday the 8th. And I just want to check before we continue, Namonde, did we get anything back from our follow-up um, email to, to SASA asking whether they're going to be sending that information? The requested information chair was supposed to be submitted to the committee on the 8th and on the 9th I followed up uh, with Sasa. I'm still waiting for a response from them. So Sasa has not responded to us members. Um, their apology for not attending today's meeting and they've asked us to reschedule this meeting where they can present an update and their plans for how they're dealing with the temporary uh, disability grant saga. Um, we, we will reschedule that, but uh, we have now asked them twice for information um, detailing their plans, so we're still waiting for that. Um, unfortunately, um, they are busy with a roadshow with Minister Lindiwe Zulu today, so they could not attend to us. And um, since the 21st of January and now, they've not had time to be able to put that information together. So what I'm going to do now, members, I'm going to hand over to the department and they're going to then give us their presentation and then we will engage with questions um, and a discussion around that. Uh, Dr. McDonald, I'm going to hand over to you and your colleagues. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, we, uh, we will, I will then ask uh, that uh, Ms. Horson uh, proceed. Uh, Ms. Wilson does need to leave the meeting uh, a little earlier um, uh, due to another commitment, so I'll ask if, uh, with your permission that she be allowed to uh, go first with the presentation. Uh, she will be dealing with the, the support to the disabled. Thank you. That's in order. Thank you Thank very you much, Chairperson. Thank you, HD. Thank you, Chair. Um, my part of the presentation, um, uh, we're supposed to be after Mr. Evers, who will speak to the food relief. My part of the presentation is focusing on uh, formal support um, to people uh, with disabilities within the um, different sectors of service delivery, which we have con uh, certain NPO co uh, NPOs that deliver that service on behalf of the department. Um, right up front, I want to state that um, this is the sector of um, the more formalized uh, support um, to people with disabilities. But in all the support services, there is food being served uh, because mm -hmm. it's um, either full-time residential or parcel residential type of services. Um, so in terms of the support to persons with disabilities, um, this past year, 164 million rand was um, allocated for the services. Of I'm sorry, Ms. Wilson. Uh, yes. Um, just, just to say, can we, we flight the uh, presentation on the screen for the benefit of the committee? Um, I don't know whether Ms. Jam Jamke would like to put it up or whether uh, the uh, chairperson would like us to put it up. Uh, uh, what, uh, just maybe an indication uh, of the preference. If, if you could um, put it up, that would be helpful, sir. Um, oh, okay, that's okay. fine. I might have uh, trouble with that one. <laughs> um, um, okay, we can... Um, we can arrange. Is Ms. Jamke able to put it up on that side? Put it up. Uh, okay, Ms. Evo, you can try. Thanks, Ms. Evo. 
Okay, I will, I will so long just speak oh, to the go. first slide. I see Ms. Jen. Ms. Yes, Baby, you must now go right through to my part, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the blue yeah. part, yeah. Right, okay. There we go. And then we can just put uh, yeah. bigger. Oh, well, I can unshare this one. Sorry, is, is Ms. Jamka putting up or is Mr. Hewell putting up? Because I think you both tried to put it up now. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was up already. Okay, I'm, I'm putting it up again. Okay, thanks. Mr. Hewell can put it up then. In terms of the categories that we are funding while we are waiting, um, we fund um, 39 residential care facilities, um, 50 protective workshops, six 60s um, service center organizations, which is more the head office. We don't um, uh, fund them directly in terms of food, but the, um, the recipients of the service um, um, also do get food over and above the normal services. And then also the daycare or special care centers, uh, which also includes a, a partial ECD um, is in that sector, allocated in that sector. Um, and, and the different funds allocated to that is also indicated, um, which varies between 50 million, 22, 65, 24, 162, and 1 1.5 million. Is then the surplus that we experience during the year, and that surplus will go to the adaptive vehicles um, in the disability sector as a result of the court case. In terms of the spread of this funding um, across the province, um, you will see the pie chart there. Um, the bulk of the funding do go to the regions. Um, however, there's a substantial part of the funding that goes to Eden Karoo um, and the Cape Winelands. Um, the sector or the area that gets the least funding is then the West Coast. It's just um, because there is uh, less formal residential care environments in that area. Um, in terms of the program priorities, um, the first one was to strengthen the community-based daycare program for adults with disabilities um, and to standardize the service um, and the quality of the service. The second um, one was the um, the it, the partial care facilities and the daycare centers for children with disabilities. And that was done in collaboration with the ECD and the partial care directorate um, to give effect to the legislation, uh, the Children's Act legislation. Um, and then lastly, it was to promote and continue advocating, advocating for the disability mainstreaming across the department through the disability desk. The program priorities was um, a joint effort um, with Victim Empowerment Program, um, also to ensure that people with disabilities have access to victim empowerment services. And then we also gave uh, substantial um, money to uh, PPE and COVID support. We've um, given 15,000 to each and every organization um, across the sector, in addition to their normal funding. And then lastly, which we are currently busy with, is registering the recipients or the staff members within this um, areas of service delivery for the vaccine, um, as they will be a priority group under phase one already. And then the uh, persons with disability and the other non-frontline workers within the sector will um, be part of phase two. Yeah, that's my short part. I think the bulk of the support in terms of food relief is from Mr. Evil. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Horson. Uh, Chairperson, would you like us to continue with um, the the other section of our presentation, or uh, would, would you like to uh, have questions now? Um, I think it's best if members ask their questions now, then um, if Ms. Horson does need to leave, she's able to do so. Um, members, based on the portion that we've just covered now, please may I ask that you raise your hand for questions. I see Member McKenzie. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Chairperson, the obvious question 
where do individuals organizations access these services how do they access these services and given we are um, a few weeks away from year end is there still funding available for new organizations to access some of these services and how do they do it thank you chairperson uh, yes member is that member Paku Paku Force? yes please go ahead ma'am Yes, I also have a question. Um, um, my question for now is that, um, as he, they are stating that there were uh, there were challenges I, uh, during COVID nineteen and everything. I want to know how has COVID nineteen impacted on food security for the people in the province, and how is the department dealing with that problem? And the second question is that what is the number of community gardens and household gardens that are supported? And what are the plans to increase the number of household gardens, seeing that majority of families have lost resources of income? That's my question. And um, I want to know in their plan, about uh, um, supplying the vaccine, uh, are they going to 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 to, to assist the benef the beneficiaries also of their CNTC and the staff members of the their CNTCs? Thank you, Chair. Member Philander. Chairperson, thank you. Um, Chairperson, can the department please provide? Um, some more and clear insight into the collaborative approach with regards to food security in the Western Cape. Um, the collaborative approach between national and um, and provincial, um, the real um, impact of that, and the as I said, the the collaboration uh, between the two spheres. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so there's some questions there for Ms. Khosan and then some that I've noted that I think Mr. Heru will cover in his presentation. So Ms. Khosan, you may go ahead and answer the ones that you think you can based on what you presented and your area of expertise. And then we will move on to the rest of the presentation. And I'm sure Mr. Heru will be able to answer a lot of the questions around food security um, as well as the collaborations. Um, back to you, Ms. Khosan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think it's just Member uh, McKenzie's question that are relevant to my uh, part of the presentation. Um, as you know, we go into a funding cycle of three years where we do a call of proposals um, for organizations to submit their business plans with, for funding. We however do, um, where there's a specific need, approach organizations within this cycle. Um, to address if there's any shortfall. We are currently at the end of the past three year cycle. So the call for proposals for the next uh, three financial years are in the finalization phase where we are busy allocating the funds and screening the, applica screening the applications and, um, and allocating the funds. So I'm sure that if there was a, a, a new organization or organization that can deliver on the outcomes that was publicized um, in the media that they would have applied. Uh, we will finalize that process um, end of March, and I'm sure that in the next, in the new financial year, the standing committee will then be informed how many and provided with a list of organizations that are funded. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. uh, Member McKenzie, is that a follow-up? Yes, Chairperson, if I may, thank you uh, uh, for the answer, and I really appreciate it. In, uh, let's assume individuals, so I'm going to silence the other call. Let, uh, let's, uh, individuals and not specifically organizations that, uh, uh, and one or two that might have fallen through the cracks, that didn't notice, is there a space where they can still, through either organizations that are approved or that will be approved, access these services, or is that completely closed off? And disabled individuals that, for example, I'm just using Mitchell's plane, that is not part of registered NGOs. How do they access these services? Thank you. 
Ms. Uh, Member Windhoek, I see your hand as well. Thank you, Chairperson. I just need clarity on the answer of, of, of um, the person who presented uh, the, the, the uh, presentation. Is he saying, because I'm not sure, because I, I think Mr. Member McKenzie were asking in terms of call for proposal, is that, is it, is it, is it close? So I just need a clear answer on that. So is it close? Uh, and then are you sending out invitations or, or uh, notices that people can apply and, 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 and which time before uh, your cycle close? Do you normally send out those uh, uh, invitations uh, for, for call for proposals? Thank you, Jay. Members, are there any other follow-up questions for Ms. Hoerson, um before we excuse her? Okay. Ms. Hoerson, you may answer and then we'll um, go back to the presentation. Thank you. If I may start with Member Windvogel. Um, the call for proposals went out um, last year, middle of the year. And um, also all the, um, it went out in all the media, as well as on the website of the department. Um, and then we also notified all current providers that um, such a call for proposals went out. Um, so the, the, the process is, is um, closed at this stage. However, um, should there be an organization um, that approaches us now or an individual, as um, Member McKenzie requested, we can refer them um, to an organization to whom funds were, um, and, and the con uh, TPA was already um, been signed with, to see if, if that there is any um, uh, fields where they can collaborate um, or not. But that will be up to the decision of that individual um, agencies. In terms of the recipients of the service, they can access any of these services at any given time. They don't have to be um, already enrolled in one of the services um, by the time that we allocate the funds. Um, this is, uh, uh, all these services are open to members of the public throughout the contract per period, um, and they can um, access the services in their areas as like, for instance, in Mitchell's plane. I don't know if the HOD maybe want to add something. Yes, thanks. Um, I think uh, to, uh, in terms of Honourable Member Van Vogel's question, the, uh, the call for proposals for NGOs was advertised uh, last year. Um, I think it was around uh, September. Uh, and then the proposals are um, received by the department and and so uh, the, the I can we can give you the closing day. I don't have it immediately available chair, but uh, but I, I, I can provide all those dates, but yeah, it has already closed um, toward the end of last year it, it closed already. So the, that gives the department uh, the beginning of this year, which is basically the last quarter of the financial year to finalize uh, all of the applications. Uh, and uh, determine which ones uh, meet the criteria and which ones uh, can be accommodated with an available budget. And then the, uh, the allocations are approved uh, during the, the course of uh, February, which, which has been happening now, uh, and, and March. And then uh, the, the, the allocations are then finalized in the form of a, a transfer payment agreement that's signed between the department and the NGOs that are funded. So uh, at this point of the year, uh, most of the allocations are done already. Um, sometimes, uh, as we've seen in, in the presentation by Ms. Horsten, there is some funding uh, left over at the end of a financial year or towards the end of a financial year because uh, an NGO, for example, decides that they can't continue operating and they close, uh, and then the funding the department would have transferred to them is then saved. Uh, or sometimes um, the organizations will uh, find that they didn't uh, weren't able to use all of the funds uh, that were provided. 
and then in, in those cases, then also there's a potential saving for the department. So there is sometimes a possibility to um, uh, to fund additional organisations towards the end of a year. Um, but at the moment, the, the programme office will allocate funding based on what they have budget for uh, and based on the successful applicants in the after the, 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 the applications have come in. And they will, they'll usually allocate all of their budgets uh, up front um, so that so they can be sure that they maximize service delivery outputs um, and, and have that all set up from the beginning of the year uh, so that they can utilize their budget. So uh, it's, uh, it's a standard process that uh, the department embarks upon uh, in terms of its NGO funding policy um, and all the steps that are set out in the NGO funding policy, which is more or less aligned with the national NGO funding policy that was recently adopted um, uh, in, uh, at a national level. Uh, uh, there was, there was uh, several years of work on that. So it's, it's very, very much the same uh, as our policy. Um, the the other questions um, from the from the uh, honourable members, um, I think the, the question about um, the uh, the accessing of the services has already been dealt with. Um, I don't know if there's need for more detail there. Um, and uh, also the 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 question of um, in some instances uh, where we do have. Uh, additional funds uh, or different additional service needs uh, that we are willing to fund. Uh, we will also then do uh, calls for um, proposals from NGOs uh, between our funding cycles. But generally, our funding cycles last uh, for three years. So we advertise every three years. The NGOs put in their applications. We allocate funding on a three-year basis, and then after three years, we we call for proposals again. Um, so the, what we've just done now uh, it, it, towards the end of last year was the um, the beginning of a new uh, three-year cycle. Thank you. Honorable Brunkers, is that a follow-up question or can we move on to the rest of the presentation and have that question later? Uh, no, Chair, it's not a follow-up question. I haven't asked a question yet. Uh, maybe we, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, I'll wait uh, for later. Thank you. Okay, um, can we then move on to Mr. Hill's part of the presentation um, and then take the rest of the questions? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Mr. Hill, would you like to go ahead? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, HOD. Is the presentation on the screen? Uh, yes, we can see it. Uh, thanks, Mr. Hill. Maybe just put it full screen. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mr. Thank Sarah. you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, we already indicated that we are here uh, to the committee to speak about uh, the support to give to people with disabilities, which my colleague has already covered, and community development will speak about the food relief broadly. Uh, Chair, the, that is the purpose and the background. We just want to touch on the evolution of the virus and its impact. To, to people generally, particularly on food security. We will want to talk about the criteria that we use to distribute the food relief, the interventions that we use, and also the support that we kicked in now in, in February, which is additional support to what we have done right through the financial year. And also talk briefly about the importance of collaboration, because as the department, we are not doing these interventions alone. We are complementing the, the interventions that are done by other agencies, NGOs, and so on. Then most importantly, how are we going to monitor? How are we going to... I beg your pardon, Chair. Um, then Mr. Hill, you can continue. I don't think anybody was interrupting. OK. We, we will then deal with the, the question of how we are going to monitor these interventions so that we ensure that the service provided went to, 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 to the right people. We've already indicated why we are here, Chair. Then just on the background, in December 2019, the world awoke to the escalating crisis of the coronavirus, which is COVID-19. This crisis reached the pandemic status with the infection across the globe and subsequent death. On the 14th of March, 
2020, President of the Republic of South Africa, Honorable Cyril Ramaphosa, declared a national state of disaster due to the, break, to the outbreak of the coronavirus. On the 23rd of March, the president declared a 21-day national lockdown to keep residents at home beginning from 26 March 2020. From the adjusted level five lockdown up until level three, thousands of people have lost their jobs. Creation of new opportunities in the form of jobs have become increasingly challenging given the strain that the economy took, causing job losses in business, in the private sector, and industries, thereby resulting in, in widespread food insecurity. Across all these levels of the national lockdown, the economy could not sustain or maintain jobs. Many people were simply rendered socioeconomically vulnerable and food insecure. The criteria that we use to distribute food and that we continue to use today, we concentrate on those households that are affected by COVID-19 infection in the following way. A member of the family who tested positive for the virus and is in quarantine in his or her home. A household where a member of the family who tested positive for the virus, who have insufficient means to sustain themselves during the lockdown period. We also looked at a person who is on medication, who suffers from a chronic illness and is, is, is insufficient means to sustain him or herself. And that person was assessed and referred by a local clinic or registered health practitioner, where they say a, a, a GP or so. And the person and the household who have insufficient means to sustain themselves during the lockdown period were assessed and referred by a registered humanitarian relief organization, referred by the department, by registered MPOs, or by municipal manager. In these instances, the elderly, child headed household, grand awaiting beneficiaries are always receiving our priority. Then members will remember that. Members of the public who were in need of food uh, during the lockdown had to call one of the following numbers. We had a toll-free number, we had a please call number, and we had an email address where requests had to be, be sent via. The food requests were consolidated at the call center into a DSD regions and sent to the relevant region for assessment. Those who qualify for a food parcel their food details were sent to the contracted humanitarian relief organization for distribution of a food parcel. Then the, the food relief intervention, yes, the food relief intervention is, and even then it was characterized by the following intervention. We issued food parcels. We issued the food through our community nutrition and development centers. We supported the existing community-based kitchens that were feeding in communities. And then we're also issuing food support and other non-food support to people uh, who are homeless and were not accommodated in DST funded shelters. On the food parcels, DST has provided the following food parcel intervention thus far since the declaration of the lockdown and the disaster in March. First, the, the first uh, part of our food parcel distribution was a 50,000 food parcels, which raised more than 200,000 beneficiaries. That was, uh, during that time, we also contracted NPOs uh, to deliver 4,920 food parcels to certain outlying areas in the province, and that intervention uh, cost us about 3.6 million, and it reached more than 19,000 beneficiaries. Uh, later, Towards the end of the year, we also provided 6,000 food parcels, which reached the 24,000 uh, beneficiaries. Uh, during this time, we also provided uh, 10 kg maize meal, 3,500 of them, uh, to a certain community that was highlighted as uh, being in need of such support, and 14,000 people were reached. So the total uh, uh, um, cost for food parcel is in excess of 26 million chairs. And that has reached more than 257,000 beneficiaries. Then the community nutrition and development centers. It's important that the pro to outline that the program also provided uh, hot meals daily to 
to about 5,000 beneficiaries at the 20 old community nutrition and development centers that were previously funded by National DST during the financial year 2019-20. Existing DST funded feeding sites were also upscaled and provided additional food for meals to to, 18, 000, eight, to 1,890 beneficiaries, which accounts to 1890 meals. Furthermore, DSD supported 15 beneficiary organizations, providing food reliefs to more than 10,000 beneficiaries by an organization called Food for South Africa that provided these beneficiary organizations with ingredients to prepare hot meals. Further financial injection of 3.3 million to some CNDC that had experienced increased demand for food, and that intervention reached to more than 1,600 beneficiaries. Our community nutrition and development centers, these, these are the ones that we funded through the call for proposals that we just spoke uh, about. We've got them uh, province-wide. We've got 51 NGOs that are providing on behalf of the department this service right across all the six regions of the department. Uh, this intervention had reached uh, 9,620 beneficiaries at a cost of in excess of 24 million. Support to community kitchens. The department, the department provided funding to 200 community-based kitchens throughout the province to provide food relief to vulnerable communities to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. More than 58,000 people or beneficiaries throughout the province were reached, and these community kitchens provided for to vulnerable communities to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and its related lockdowns. Support to the homeless. Following the declaration of the disaster and the subsequent countrywide lockdown that came into effect on the 26th of March, 2020, municipalities had to, had to establish temporary homeless shelters to accommodate and feed the homeless during this time. The National Department of Social Development assisted by a contracting and non-profit organization called Quirinox to provide the much more resource needed resources and relief to all provinces to the value of 50 million for food and non-food items so that we can provide it to the, the, the homeless people that were accommodated temporary shelters. The Western Cape part of this benefit, or, uh, we estimated it to about 6.5 million this is the value of the benefit we, we, we got from national to address the needs of the homeless he accommodated the temporary shelters. Uh, the tomorrow social development in the Western Cape requisitioned centrally for all temporary shelters in the, West, in the Western Cape and stored the items at the government warehouse in Hope Street, Cape Town. The relief <coughs> foods included dry foods, hygiene packs, sanitizers, personal protective equipment, blankets, mattresses, which are supplied to district municipalities on request. Then the district municipalities then would supply to their respective uh, municipalities. The dry food in included porridge, orange juice, the powdered one, chicken casserole, pasta, mints, beef, and chicken soup, which the municipality could for their homeless people. Further support from February 2020, we used the 51.2 million, which was allocated to the department during the second adjustment budget, and uh, to actually uh, spread and, 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 and contract to organization. Now in February, we, we finished with that, and we are now in the process of dispersing the payment to this organization. Food parcels, uh, we have made provision for about uh, 14 million. Uh, food parcels, which will reach more than 120 beneficiaries. Uh, we have also made a provision to address increased demand in our existing uh, community nutrition and development centers. We're just we are going to spend 4.7 million to that, and we're going to reach just short of 4,000 beneficiaries. Support to community kitchens, both urban and rural, uh, to reach uh, about 80,000 beneficiaries. In our rural kitchens, we are supporting them with 13 million, uh, which we like because we want to be biased towards the rural setup because we understand the challenges they, they are facing, their distances, transport, and the non-availability of the support generally. Then we are also going to have a voucher system 
uh, which will be provided by DJ Marie Trust to community kitchens province-wide, and they are going to raise 37,500 beneficiaries, and we're giving them four, four million for, 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 for this intervention. Also, Chair, it's important to make sure that we adhere to acceptable norms and standards of hygiene and so on, so that this food is going to be provided in the, in a hygiene situation in a manner that is acceptable, uh, delivering the service to, to our beneficiaries with dignity. And we've also made provision for personal protective equipment so that uh, our community nutrition and development center, the cooks, the volunteers and so on have got this equipment when they are providing the, the, the food to the beneficiary. Chair, we felt quite important that it's important to understand and underline that these interventions that the DST has provided and that we continue to provide are not standalone interventions. Our intervention in support of the existing interventions in communities, those interventions that were provided by South African Social Security Agency, Sinasa, some interventions were provided by community-based individuals with groups and others were provided by the churches. Non-governmental organization, the humanitarian relief organization, we're not going to mention any of them, but many of them, they came on board to assist the government to make sure that we make sure that the people are provided with food during the difficult times. Also, what we want to underline here, Chair, is the support that we have received from the private sector. It was overwhelming and I'm sure we need to record it so that it is known and they themselves understand that the more they can give, it is appreciated by government. Monitoring and reporting, Chair, this is the most difficult part, Chair. With all the challenges encountered, it is important for government to also ensure that it has, it has received value for money for the services it has rendered. Under normal circumstances, Chair, the department will have sent monitoring officials to all the organizations funded under the current COVID-19 emergency situation. Under the discourage face-to-face -face interactions during COVID-19 lockdown regulation and this related uh, protocols, the department will employ all the means at its disposal to ensure that the services provided by government have gone to the right beneficiaries at the right time in the right quality and quantities. So that is the story, Chair. That's what we've done. My colleague has already dealt with the services to people with disabilities. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Hale. Um, um, members, I, I was about to say I'd like to now take your questions, and I, before I could even think that thought, Member McKenzie's hand was up already. Um, but can I, members, can I get an indication of which members would like to ask questions? Um, what I am going to do is I'm also going to, if our guests from the Black Sash and I saw we had another person join as well. If they would like to ask any questions, if they could also just indicate. So I'm going to go with Member Brinkes, then with Member Barnes, and then we'll go with Member McKenzie. Member Brinkes. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, I would uh, like to ask the department that um, each, uh, each ward has a, a ward committee with different uh, various sectors, um, including a, a, a social and welfare sector. So I would like to ask the department that how close are they working uh, with these uh, ward committee uh, structures uh, 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 on the ground as um, uh, ward committees have a very good understanding of what is actually happening on the ground with regard to uh, food relief and those type of issues. And um, at the same time, I also would like to ask the department that um, uh, in their plans going forward, um, how much uh, emphasis are they putting on uh, religious institutions and working more closely also with the religious institutions in distributing uh, these parcels and uh, the, uh, the, this uh, food relief. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Brankais. Uh, Member Ayanda Barnes. Um, 
Um, thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity. What I wanted to know is when I see the presentation, we are only getting numbers next to the soup kitchens, the CNDCs. Can we perhaps be given names of the, uh, the, the NGOs that received money, not just uh, figures that we are getting? Thank you, Chair. Uh, bye, Danke. Uh, Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, just uh, for future purposes, if we can get page numbers to this slide so one can start referencing the page number, because it is a bit difficult to reference it. Um, then I would like to go to the similar question to what Member Barnes has asked, and we can make the recommendation in the committee. A list of the NGOs, and obviously their physical addresses, where are they based, so that we can see when they distribute these feedings. Because what is important that we, uh, some NGOs and not all of them, get funding from the city of Cape Town, from this municipality, and we don't know if they double dipping. Uh, obviously, the more they get, the more they can deliver. Uh, uh, but it's important that the spread is also far and wide. And given that we are public reps, and as Mr. Hale said, the officials can't get anywhere, it's nice if we can also be that extra eyes and ears in the community to ensure that the needs get to where it's actually deserved. And then to the question, what I'd like to see on the, the uh, if we can go to the slide, the further support from February and one appreciate the 51 million. And I wanted to find out from Mr. Hewu, given I think 53 million was given last year, I think around March, April, if I'm correct. Has there been a comparison done to say of the initial funding that we've given support during the first phase of the lockdown and now we were given 51? Are these two similar organizations? Uh, first of all, is it to the same NGOs? And then to similar organizations, for example, if we've given food parcels, if we look at what we've done in the first uh, part of the lockdown and say the food parcels, I see we've allocated 14.8 million, 85 million, um, is a similar percentage of the 51 million allocated to food parcels, say that worked. So if you gave 10,000, for example, an example, uh, of the first tranche of 53 million, uh, 10,000 food parcels to Mitchell's Plain, let's give another 10,000 food parcels to Mitchell's Plain because it worked. Or have they looked at and say, let's perhaps do 50,000 uh, um, food demands or food relief because the food parcels didn't work? Has something like this been done? And if I just do the basic calculations, uh, um, food parcels, if I do 14 million divided by 120,000, 4 million divided by 3,700, there seem to be a discrepancy in the numbers in terms of how we, the food parcels is much cheaper than the uh, 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 food support. So I'm trying to get an understanding in my mind. The food increase to CNDCs, is that a monthly allocation? Is that per plate? How do they work out their numbers? The support to the, uh, I can understand that the support to the rural areas, it just looks like more than 70% more expensive because the people need to drive out. They probably come to buy the stuff in Cape Town to distribute in Friedendale. But between the CNDCs and the metro distributions, how do they work it out? Is that per plate? Is that per plate over four days? I just want to get an understanding of the beneficiaries. And when it comes to monitoring any variation, is there a system in place to ensure if Ricardo gets a, a grant from the government, for example, let's say the 350 rand, uh, who monitors to ensure that Ricardo doesn't get, obviously he needs the food, but for somebody who does not get anything, is there a system in place that Ricardo doesn't get an old age grant, whatever two or three grants and still get from NGOs? Is there such a system in place? And the standard of the food, uh, um, how do we think that officials can't get out there? Uh, for example, yesterday I was at the NGO in, in Woodlands, my constituency, which was plain, and the aunties came with a, with a nice pot, a bag of potatoes, some rice, uh, um, and for a thousand rand, I mean, they can feed about four or five hundred people uh, with a decent plate of food, which I also normally enjoy. So has a study been done by the finance guys in the social development department to say, are we getting value, value for money per plate of food? So if Auntie Maria in Hoodland say, you know, it's cost 80 then to, to feed a plate of food, what monitoring relation is to ensure that 
that actually is what it is, and not if you work out by on my calculations, now 236 rand per plate. Like I said, my numbers could be wrong. It could include administration fee, head office fee. I don't know. But where are those numbers and where can we get those numbers to effectively provide oversight over what is presented to us here today? And then last question, Chair, has this now completely done and closed? Um, I mean, I have seen some of the, the, the advertisements uh, that, that has come out, but like any organizations, people are missing things. I mean, we're living in a pandemic. Not everybody gets the newspapers, not because there's a lot of aunties cooking in our community that is not registered NGOs, but they do a fabulous job in serving where some of these big corporates don't get to. How do we reach them? And is this process completely closed? If Ante Maria tomorrow see in the newspapers, NGO got 5 million or 1 million or 50,000, and she's been feeding kids religiously in Hootlands. Is there an opportunity for her to get in somewhere? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Member Mackenzie. I've got a question from Member Makamba Boitja. Um, she's having some technical difficulties and I've asked um, that I asked the question on her behalf. And uh, the first question is, she, um, she would like the department to provide the committee with the process that is in place in terms of monitoring and evaluation. So at, on top of what is presented already um, and how soup kitchens are being evaluated. And she mentions there that it's registered soup kitchens, um, especially the ones funded by the department. What are the compliance measures in place? Because what she's observed on the ground is that unregistered soup kitchens get sponsored by registered soup kitchens through food donations. So the question is if the registered um, soup kitchens are able to donate food to unregistered soup kitchens, what exactly are the registered um, soup kitchens doing? And then um, just a, a more broader question um, around um, care facilities and this question that we might have to put in writing as well. Uh, just it's on the insourcing of facilities for vulnerable um, young people on the child and youth care centers. She wanted to know if the department has committed to insourcing all facilities. Um, why does it say there that the why, why is the department said that the, the strategy will need to change? What is the change in the strategy? Um, are the departments still taking in um, new vulnerable young people? Um, and is there a call center in place for this? But like I said, I might be interpreting her a text message to me wrong, but we will be able to put that in writing as well. Um, I see member Windvogel. Chairperson, I'm covered, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other members that would like to pose a question? Chairperson? Yes, Member McKenzie? I forgot one question. That's my final question. Okay. Also from the department, on the, again, there's some slight numbers, so it's difficult to, to, to get there, uh, but let me just see my note. On the PPE uh, um, supply, I see we've allocated, or looks like we two million uh, rand. Yeah, that's a slide. Norms and standard divided by 9620. It is about 206 rand. Uh, 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 what is the? Uh, what do you expect them to buy? Is are you expect these individuals to? Because that's 9,260. Is that for individual persons? Uh, uh, is that for individual NGOs? If we can just clarify that, because that's like I said, it's 206 rand. So what do you expect them to buy? Glass, hand sanitizer. If one can just get an understanding, because it's difficult to have proper. A questions we don't understand. So, so for, for future purposes, one can also, but, but we will, we'll make the recommendations in the uh, afterwards, just how we'd like some of these numbers just to assist us better understand them. But, but for now, we just give you clarity. Is that per person, per NGO, and what do you expect them to buy from the two million? Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other uh, questions from members? Okay, Mr. Hale, I'm also just going to ask you to remember, and I'm not sure if you if you got them earlier, but in the first round of questions to Ms. Corson, uh, Member Bakubaku Force, as well as Member Philander asked questions, and Member Bakubaku Force asked around the... Yeah, yes, I've got them, sir. Okay, perfect. Um, member Vindvoche, I see your hand flashing. Yes, thanks, Chair. 
Weet jy, ek sal graag net wil weet by voet pasel op die is uh, uh, wat nou hier so uh, op, die, op die skerm verskyn. Hierdie uh, kos of voet pasels, as dit net vir NGO's of het die municipaliteit ook een rol gespeel of was hulle ook deel van die uh, partners van die department uh, van, um, van uh, Department of Social Development. So ek, ek benodig net die inlichting. Dankie, Tje. Uh, dankie, mevrouw Winvogel. Um, Mr. Heer, we will hand over to you now. And member McKenzie, the slides are numbered. If you open in PowerPoint, there, there's a scroll bar um, on the side that it's, there are numbers attached to each. So I'm looking at the presentation on the screen. Oh, okay. So when it's in it's full screen, you don't screen. see numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chair, thank, thank you so much. You have, you have covered me on the numbers of the slides. Uh, the the AJD will actually fill up on some of the of the of the issues. Chair, the, the, there was a question on collaboration, which I think, unless the member is not satisfied, we have indicated how we are collaborating. And there was also a question on food gardens. Chair, we. We collaborate on food gardens with the Department of Agriculture, but the Department of Agriculture is, is, is actually playing the leading role. Uh, what we have done here, I'll just make an example of a project in Marysburg. Uh, the Department of Agriculture was involved with the promotion of community-based, uh, rather household-based hou household food gardens. And then we went into, we've got the Community Nutrition Development Center there. We went there and checked which people uh, that are our beneficiaries into, into the feeding sites are willing to have their own garden and so on. And then those that were willing, we shared the names and details with the, to the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Agriculture assessed them and then and, and gave them the, the startup tool to actually start their own food gardens. And that is something that we are scaling. Uh, as per the need and, and the available resources from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, there's a question there from Honorable Brengais on the what committees. Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Member, we are aware of the existence of what committees and the sectors. Uh, what we do, our local offices, which means DST local offices, have got what they call uh, sector forum where municipalities are present, and municipalities usually invite their white committees to participate in that forum. But from head office, we only deal with the municipalities on the understanding that the municipalities have already processed the issues with their white committees and so on, and then by the time they interact with us, and then they've reached that level. The plan, uh, whether we are involving religious organizations. Yes, Honorable Member, we are working with religious organizations. Uh, there are many of the, for instance, of the, human, the humanitarian relief organizations that helped us with food parcels. Uh, are, 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 are most of them on the Muslim religion. And we also worked uh, with an organization called Warehouse, which is a coalition of Christian organizations. Uh, and some of them are developing are working with the Solidarity Fund to develop uh, food vouchers. So we are already working with, uh, with, with, with the religious sector. And uh, although uh, in terms of this funding uh, through the call for proposals, uh, none of them have, have done the, the application for funding, but we work with them on general humanitarian relief and the response thereof. Honorable Bans, Yes, madam, we will provide the, 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 the list of the NPOs that, that, that were funded. We will provide their full details, Honorable Mackenzie, where they are and, and so on. We've got a spreadsheet that we will share with the committee when we receive the, 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 the written uh, questions. Uh, further, Honorable Mackenzie, we appreciate and agree that if you've got all the details of what is happening, which are the, the kitchens that we are supporting. You members of parliament will definitely be our extra ears and eyes to ensure that we, we are able and to deliver effectively and the services are going to the correct people and government has received a value for money. 
Honorable Mackenzie, on the 51.2 million, what we did, you have asked whether we've used the same NGOs or new NGOs. It has been a combination, a hybrid uh, intervention, uh, Honorable Mackenzie. Uh, during the first uh, phase, whether it was food parcels or support to community kitchens, there are organizations that did it very well. So we wanted to use those experiences and give them a second chance to, to roll this, this funding out. Also, we had a, a view that says in the department, the wider we spread uh, this, these resources, the more we are able to charge all the areas within our province and vulnerable communities. As a result of that, we also through the Western Cape Food Forum, we had new organizations that we brought in and uh, both in the food parcels, in the support to community kitchen, uh, and, 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 and then of course in the, 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 the community nutrition and development centers, those are all the organizations that we are funding. We didn't take a new organization in that intervention, but in all other interventions where we have taken a new organization. The, the CNDCs, our funding formula, honorable member, we will, we will uh, send it to the committee when we receive the written uh, questions, uh, but it is based on the, 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 the per head uh, um, allocation. For instance, per person is 860. That 860, it's all the cost of, 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 of getting that, that plate to, to the beneficiary and so on. So we will we'll, we'll, we'll get that to the committee. And we feed one meal per day and we feed for five days, Monday to Friday, uh, in all our community nutrition development centers. We do that. We tried to, to, to see, because we thought that the people are vulnerable, we tried to see if it will work, if we can feed is Saturday and Sunday. Uh, regrettable, uh, the experience in those uh, areas where we tested, people were simply not coming uh, for food during the weekends. Uh, I'm sure there are other things that, that, that keep them busy uh, during the weekends. Just as the, the Sasa days, Sasa days we cook less because generally people are not coming for our food during Sasa days. On the MNE, uh, honorable member, there is a general m &E process that we use, which now has been handicapped and hindered by the challenges imposed by COVID-19. We will, we, we, we will make that process available. Uh, in that there is a slide where we're talking about this, and uh, our research unit has, has also, we are going to have um, a workshop uh, with them where they are going to, to workshop us and see how we can use WhatsApp linking with the GPS coordinates so that if we've got a colleague in, 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 in Meverville, for instance, the colleague can use WhatsApp and take pictures and then the GPS can actually tell us that it is in Meverville and then we can see what is happening. So we'll use a combination of innovative ways to try and make sure that the service and, and, and that, that government is, is, is rendering and the support is, give, is getting to the to the right people, so that 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 is the point. It's a challenge for all of us, but we are not sitting. Our laurels, we are trying to find something and see how we can better this funding formula. Yes, uh, so when we receive the questions, we'll provide we'll provide the full details of how the the, the, the funding formula is, is is has been worked. Community kitchens, Honorable Mackenzie. We knew that we will find this question. Uh, that the, how did you find these kitchens? What we did proactively as a department, as early as it, uh, in, 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 in April, May, we knew that there will come a time where the support we are giving as government is unable to reach out to everybody that needs our, 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 our care and service. We requested our regions to actually go out in all communities, meaning in all towns and all areas, in their respective regions. And look at for those mamas that are cooking there, put a database together and send it to us so that we know in Edgeville, there is a mama that is cooking there, Lendechie, uh, in Etheridge and so on. There are mamas that are cooking and we've got a database. Some of these mamas um, have got no NPOs correctly. Some have got NPOs 
we have put those, those together into our database. And we accept that there might be few that we will have missed during this process. So we have used that database and contracted the big organizations like uh, Ikam Valabandu and say, Ikam Valabandu, here is the list of kitchens in Mitchell's place. Please, we are giving you X amount, get the, 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 the groceries and so on, and go to these kitchens and buy and deliver groceries to them so that they can cook. All we need from you and the kitchen is the proof of the attendance register saying that the kitchen has got 20 beneficiaries, those beneficiaries have been fed uh, on a daily basis, if it's on a daily basis, and here is proof. And we accept, as we said, that there will be anomalies in this list, but we have tried to use a scientific way of identifying the, the, these kitchens. And it's across those that are non-registered, unregistered, they are basic, but they are providing quality service, we have taken those on board, both urban and rural. On the personal protective equipment, those funds are allocated to N N NPOs as, as support or the stop gap to what they are not able to have. We are aware that during this process, the Solidarity Fund has provided masks, has provided gloves, has provided goggles, has provided sanitizers to many of these organizations. So this little amount that we are providing is where there are gaps, those organizations will procure what they, 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 they see as necessary for them. We have encouraged them to clap so that they can actually take advantage of the economies of scale so that they don't buy individually. If in Oton they need mask, then they buy mask and then they buy in bulk so that they just distribute those amongst, amongst the NPOs. Honorable Vodka, uh, that is about M&E, and I've, I think I've already covered that, unless the HOD will, will add something. The monitoring of the, the, the kitchens, and then it's going to be very difficult. All what we, 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 we trust, we are giving funds to big organizations. We are monitoring the big organizations. These big organizations must monitor their individual kitchens. It is, it, it is not corruption if you see that it, there is some registered uh, NPOs giving groceries to unregistered NPOs. That is what we requested with them. We've requested that if you are unable to reach a certain area and there is a mama that is feeding there, give them from your surplus what you can give them so that they can cook for that, for that area. All what they must do, they must give you a register to show you that they didn't use that, 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 that grocery for own use, they've actually used it to extend the government service that way. So we appreciate, we are happy that these NPOs have actually done that and gave groceries to unregistered uh, um, uh, facilities to cook. Honorable Benfall, on the food parcels, yes, those food parcels, this, what we are reporting is only food parcels that came from the budget of the Western Cape government which has been given to the Department of Social Development. And we've used the municipalities in the distribution. Yes, they have distributed where they can, particularly in the Eden Caro, the relationship is excellent. Municipalities have actually sent teams to assist with the house-to-house -house distribution of the 50,000 food parcels. However, in ending, these food parcels, there will be no mass distribution of them. We are going to dedicate these food parcels to our regions so that the, our regions and NGOs that we are supporting can actually identify the need and then we take the an X number of food parcels to that NGO that has identified the need and that NGO to give us proof that it has delivered these food parcels to those uh, needy beneficiaries. Uh, I will oh, hand over to the HOD uh, to, to, to close any gaps that I might have left. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Oh, sorry, Chairperson. Uh, no, thank you for that. I just wanted to just to clarify. Um, I didn't hear the part on the PPE. Was that per person or per NGO? And then also the, the new funding. Does that mean that NGOs are getting funding beyond April 1st? 
thank you, Chair. The, the, the funding is provided, uh, the, the allocations are per NGO. So those, those amounts are to enable the NGOs to ensure their staff uh, and uh, that their, their distribution points are properly equipped uh, with PPE so that they can serve the public safely. Um, so it's for sanitizers, uh, mask, gloves, uh, and cleaning products uh, to make sure that their, um, their uh, space that they're serving the public from is properly COVID compliant. Um, I think the the maybe uh, just to to add to some of the points that Mr. Hare was made, um, the coordination with the uh, ward committees and and other structures uh, is something that's also happening uh, through the hotspots approach that the province has adopted uh, to address the COVID disaster. So um, the the hotspot teams have been set up for uh, each of the Department of Health district areas, uh, which are led by um, a... Um, members, please may I ask that you mute yourselves? Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, there's so... Uh, the the hotspot teams have been set up uh, with a with a HOD leading each of the teams and an MEC uh, leading each of the teams, uh, and they convene hotspot engagements uh, with the stakeholders from that hotspot. And um, those hotspots uh, teams are are made up of representatives from uh, each of the provincial departments, as well as from the municipality in question, whether it's a district municipality or a local municipality, and also uh, in the metro area, it's um, uh, representatives from the city of Cape Town's um, uh, area-based um, or, or um, the, the area teams that they have, and uh, also representatives from uh, the wards, uh, either the ward councillors or ward committee members, uh, and also representatives from civil society uh, and um, other local structures um, are also invited. So those hotspot teams' uh, job is essentially to help coordinate uh, the implementation of uh, the various services that are required for the response to the COVID disaster, which includes, for example, now the vaccine rollout, but also the um, the rollout of uh, the um, uh, safety uh, plan uh, or the or the safety COVID safety measures. So the distribution of masks and PPE and those sorts of things to businesses uh, and to schools and and all those other things. There, there's also those teams are also responsible for assisting uh, with um, the coordination of the campaigns for behavior change to get people to wear masks and uh, social distancing. Uh, and they've been uh, overseeing uh, the compliance enforcement by uh, the city's law enforcement and SAPS and so on. Uh, SAPS is also represented on the uh, hotspot teams. So those teams have also been playing a role in terms of helping to steer and coordinate the uh, provision of uh, humanitarian relief in the form of food relief uh, and and related measures. And um, the uh, those teams are, are then collecting data on food relief in each of the areas. So it, it helps to break the province down into, into different sections that are a little bit more manageable. And it also enables us to focus on where uh, the needs are geographically. So that has provided a coordinating mechanism between the different spheres of government as well as between uh, the government and community structures. And uh, the, the, the city of Cape Town in, in the metro areas has also, of course, got its own um, structures that interface, for example, with ward committees uh, via the sub-council and so on. And those, uh, those structures together with the area-based teams or community-based teams that the city has set up um, to coordinate their operations uh, in each uh, community are, are then feeding back into the hotspot teams. So that's one of the structures that, that assists in terms of coordination of uh, food relief. But in addition to that, we also have the um, provincial level structures that report into the Coronavirus uh, Coordinating Council that, uh, that is the special cabinet uh, with all um, the district mayors on there, as well as 
uh, SAPs represented and um, various other uh, government entities as, which has been established uh, under the disaster management uh, regulations. And uh, the, this, the, one of the sub-committees uh, of the uh, Provincial Coordin Coronavirus Coordinating Committee uh, is the, um, the Humanitarian Relief uh, Workstream, which is uh, now known as the Dignity, Wellbeing and Dignity uh, Workstream. And that, that has also been coordinating um, food relief as one of its tasks, among other things. Uh, and we uh, have, the, have engagements uh, at that level as well, where we get all the feedback from the hotspots uh, on the food relief and humanitarian relief. And uh, we also have representatives of SASA, uh, representatives from uh, all the uh, municipalities, uh, district municipalities are there. And so uh, that, that it provides a high level coordinating mechanism. That, that uh, body is also um, uh, worked with civil society to set up some uh, external structures to help us interface. Uh, one is the faith-based organization. So we, we have uh, a, a faith-based organization um, forum that's been set up in the province by uh, religious leaders um, from across uh, uh, various religious denominations. Uh, and uh, that forum engages uh, with the province uh, on a regular basis as well uh, on, on aspects as to how the uh, faith-based organizations can support the relief efforts and also uh, provides an opportunity for the province to uh, provide information uh, that the religious leaders can take back to their constituents and, and congregations. So, uh, so we have quite a close working relationship with the religious leaders through that structure. And likewise, also the, the Western Cape Food Forum has been set up uh, by civil society organizations. Uh, it's being coordinated by the uh, Economic Development Partnership, and they meet uh, uh, on a, on a, a bi-weekly basis. Uh, which uh, and the province also attends that. So we also coordinate our efforts with the um, uh, civil society organizations through the provincial food forum. Uh, so, th so there's a lot of coordinating structures that have been set up both at the uh, provincial level, uh, prov province wide level, and also uh, at um, the health district level uh, in the form of the hotspot teams, um, which is in a sense a precursor and uh, will lay the, the foundations for the district, the joint district approach uh, that the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs um, is advocating for uh, government to take, uh, which envisages a much more uh, active role for the, the, particularly the district municipalities uh, in coordinating service delivery uh, through a, a very localized approach. Um, I think that. Uh, also, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the question about the impact on, on food security, I think we, we are getting quite a lot of data in. Uh, we're getting the uh, NIDCRAMS data, which is from the National Institute uh, of Disease, uh, and, and they, they are keeping uh, tabs on uh, national data of uh, food security. But we do also have the um, uh, information coming in uh, from the Department of Health, where we uh, we survey uh, the the frequency of um, cases of malnutrition and wasting that are presenting at their clinics, uh, and that data we we receive on a monthly basis, uh, which we use to help guide us as to where there's potentially uh, high risk areas uh, and lots of cases of malnutrition occurring. So far, we haven't seen a significant increase in malnutrition cases coming into the clinics. Um, which is also potentially due to the fact that a lot of people are avoiding the clinics at the moment because of the COVID risk. So it does uh, skew the figures slightly. Uh, and so we also have to overlay that information with uh, information that we get getting back from uh, the uh, Department of Social Development's local offices, uh, as well as from the municipalities, as well as from civil society. So uh, that information, the qualitative and the quantitative data is combined to create an, a picture of the uh, impact on food security in the province. Uh, thus far, the, the, it, it, from the information that we have, uh, the combined efforts of uh, SASA with the COVID grants and the uh, Department of Social Development's food relief, uh, as well as civil society's efforts and the uh, Department of Education school feeding scheme 
the indication is that there is um, sufficient support in the system uh, to address uh, uh, needs currently, uh, although there are always some areas that, that uh, where there's a gap and then we need to address those specific areas. Um, but the risk at the moment is that uh, we are now facing the um, end of the COVID grants. Uh, as of the end of January, the uh, COVID relief grants uh, or, or applications for COVID relief grants will no longer be uh, taken by SASA. SASA has informed us that they will continue to pay out the existing uh, COVID relief grants um, that, that have already been approved up until the end of uh, March of this uh, year. So up until the end of the financial year, where after um, there will no longer be any um, uh, COVID grants in payment uh, in the country. The Western Cape has just under 400,000 recipients of the COVID grant. Um, so those recipients, as at the end of March, will no longer receive those grants. Um, and we do then anticipate that there will be an increased need uh, for food relief. Um, so SASA still will, in the new financial year, have some funding available for social relief of distress, but it will be going back to pre-COVID levels. So it's not going to go uh, very far when compared to um, what was provided uh, under the COVID relief grant. I think the, um, so, so in terms of the challenges, uh, we, we have realized that, uh, that the, there's gonna be mounting pressure on food relief. We do have a lot more money now um, for food relief than we had uh, during last year, um, last calendar year, that is, because the uh, 51 million uh, that was provided to us by the National Department um, is uh, is going to assist greatly. I think also that we, we have re um, reprioritized some of our own internal funding as well, uh, some approximately um, uh, 16 million uh, during this uh, adjustment period since the adjustment in December has also from our own budget been allocated towards food relief as well. So we're hoping that we'd be able to get enough food relief into the system to last us uh, um, uh, through much of this year um, so that we do not uh, run into a crisis um, when the COVID grants end. But uh, we may also need to reinstate the, um, the arrangement that was in place during the first COVID lockdown uh, if food security does get more strained, uh, whereby additional funds were being provided to the municipalities uh, via the district municipalities um, from the Department of Local Government in the province, uh, so that the municipalities can also help to play a role because uh, they are at the front end and uh, they face a lot of the pressure when, um, when food shortages start to occur. Um, so I think that uh, Mr. Hewa has spoken to community and household gardens and the Department of Agriculture is leading a food security project uh, and plan for the province. They, they're basically looking at how we can move from uh, food aid to food security because uh, the amount of funds that we currently are allocating for food relief uh, may not be sustainable given the uh, financial situation that the country is getting itself into uh, and uh, if, if it does get to the point where uh, we no longer have funds uh, to sustain uh, the levels of grants and food aid that are currently in the system, uh, we need to be able to get uh, well, to help citizens become uh, more self-reliant through things like food gardens and other income generating uh, opportunities. So uh, I think the 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 question about the provision of the vaccine to beneficiaries at CNDCs, uh, I think that's that that wouldn't be on the cards at this stage because the vaccines are um, uh, have to be stored correctly and administered by uh, health uh, professionals. Uh, so the, 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 we can't expect the community nutrition development centers to be able to administer vaccines and store them correctly, et cetera. Uh, so vaccines for the general public will need to be provided through the Department of Health's facilities. Uh, they, they're not going to be driven through NGOs that aren't able to, to do so properly. Um, the details of all that planning, of course, is still being worked out by the Department of Health because the um, uh, the flow of vaccines into the country uh, is still uh, uh, being worked out, particularly after 
the uh, setbacks with the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, uh, which has impacted on the planning and timelines uh, for the vaccination rollout. Uh, in terms of um, the collaboration between um, the provincial and national levels, I think Mr. Hewu had mentioned we, we did a lot of coordination with uh, SASA through the food, uh, the, the food um, coordination team uh, under the humanitarian work stream uh, that I mentioned earlier, which is the, the province-wide level, uh, as well as with the Solidarity Fund, uh, which has also provided uh, significant funding uh, and and food parcel support in the province so uh, there has been there has been quite a lot of coordination on that front um, I think though um, that uh, that there's going to need to be uh, even greater coordination going forward uh, particularly around um, how we balance the relative contributions and investment from SASA and the national um, sphere on the one hand, uh, and provincial and local governments on the other, uh, since uh, the, the provincial sphere, as well as local government, does not, strictly speaking, uh, have a legislative mandate to provide social security or, or social relief. It is a uh, function that's legislated uh, for SASA uh, to perform uh, under the Social Assistance Act. Uh, so, in terms of um, the, the names of NGOs, we can provide that list in writing um, as requested. We do also provide all of the names of funded NGOs um, to Parliament and stakeholders uh, in the form of an annexure every year to our annual report. Um, so, that information will also once again be provided with our annual report uh, for this financial year. Um, but uh, we can certainly provide these, these specific information um, to the committee, uh, and uh, I think also the, the the difference between the address of NGOs uh, in terms of where we their addresses for purposes of um, transactions with the Department of Funding, uh, where we sign the funding agreements and so on. The, the NGOs have uh, their addresses, but often they they are operating from other sites besides uh, their their business address. So. Uh, we would need to provide information on the distribution points, uh, not just the addresses of the actual NGO headquarters. Um, then uh, I think uh, we've we've uh, Mr. Hill was mentioned the food parcels. Uh, I think with with the with what we did learn with the food parcels is it is an expensive uh, method of delivering food relief. It was uh, something we needed to do during the hard lockdown. Um, because it was very difficult for people to move around to get food relief and we wanted to avoid uh, queuing in crowds and congregations at food uh, at feeding schemes. But uh, the reality is that um, food parcels do cost more money to, to uh, prepare and deliver and they do take longer to get to people as well uh, because of the, um, the, the whole process of delivering one at a time. Uh, so generally, our learning has been that we should reserve food parcels only for those people who are unable to access um, uh, feeding schemes in their local communities, whether it's because of geographic distance being in the rural areas or whether it's because uh, they are self-isolating due to COVID uh, or due to frailty um, or other reasons. And then um, I, th I think that uh, the monitoring Mr. Hill has spoken to uh, the, the question of um, ensuring value for money, I think, will be explained in the details of our monitoring system. But when we do um, issue funding to organizations, we do require them to provide us with a breakdown of all of the costs involved uh, that, and what they will spend, including on the products themselves. Uh, that they will be providing the food products so that we can ascertain that uh, that there is a benchmark um, for the amount of uh, money that is spent per kilogram of maize, for example, uh, so that we don't fund one organization 200 rand uh, for 10 kilos and another one 150 rand for 10 kilos. So it's it's important that we uh, that we do get that uh, broken down in the form of a business detailed business plan before 
we uh, provide funding and we've uh, adopted a standardized approach towards that and i must say that the ngos are able to come in at extremely low prices uh, much much cheaper than uh, uh tendered services or retail options so uh, there is definitely value for money um and I think also the NGOs bring a lot of their own resources to the table. Uh, they also make use of a lot of volunteers, uh, corporate donors, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, the, the economy of this process is, is uh, outstanding in terms of uh, the value for money. Uh, then I think um, the question of, of registering and, and donation of funds to unregistered registration, the only registration for uh, food uh, to f uh, feeding schemes is uh, potentially registration either as an NGO or um, the, the um, necessary uh, documentation for a trust, uh, etc. But uh, there's no um, uh, there's no uh, registration requirement to render actual service of food relief like there is, for example, to render drug treatment services. So um, the the feeding schemes. Uh, registration status is not um, material in terms of their ability to render the service, uh, but it does matter to us in terms of providing them with funding. So, uh, because we need to have a legal entity that we contract with in terms of the PFMA. So, uh, when when uh, we fund organisations that are established and that are proper legal entities uh, and registered as NPOs or non-profit companies, etc., then uh, we can fund them to distribute food stuff. Uh, to other organizations like um, uh, the examples that were given earlier of informal arrangements where um, a, 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 a group of residents get together and provide food uh, without having an NGO or anything. So, so that's an, a way for us to actually get um, supplies to those people and help them do what they're doing uh, at uh, grassroots level. Uh, and this, that, that's completely uh, legitimate as long as we make sure uh, that the organizations that are registered that we do fund, that they make sure that they keep track of all of that food and make sure that it gets to the proper beneficiaries um, by uh, following a, an audit trail with the, the details of the beneficiaries. Uh, the Auditor General does check those things as well to make sure that the uh, funds were used for the intended purposes. Um, I think the last item on the insourcing of uh, secure care uh, child and youth care uh, facilities, we have fully done that. Um, so um, yeah, the the, the uh, secure care facilities have been fully insourced in this province. Uh, I know some of the provinces are still in the process of doing that, but we we had to do it because Basasa went into liquidation. They were running um, two secure care centres, and we we had to take those over because they uh, were liquidating and shutting down operations. So we've completely insourced secure care, and we are still taking in um, vulnerable children. Uh, so uh, the question of whether there's a call centre for this, there is a call centre. Um, the provincial call centre for uh, we have social development has a number in the call centre, um, but people can also report it to their local social development office or to Childline or to any of the organisations that work in this space, uh, many of which we fund. Um, so I, I think that's uh, that's the questions that that I have. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. As always, you and Mr. Hill have both been very comprehensive. Uh, Member Vinfortel, I see your hand is still up. I don't want to ask if it's an old hand because we know Member Maria is probably listening and it'll take offence to the use of the term old hand. Is that a follow-up or is that just an oversight from earlier still? Chairperson, that was, it's an old hand, sorry. <laughs> okay. I think it's old hand. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hand that was previously up. We won't use the term old hand anymore, Member Baku Baku Force. Um, members, are there any other uh, follow up questions? Um, any questions of clarity that you'd like? Member Mackenzie, is that an old hand or previously held it's up a hand? Really young it's an old hand, Chairperson, not the previous hand. <laughs> Please go ahead, Mr. Mackenzie. Thanks, Chair. I just want to make sure that, just for the avoidance of any doubt in my mind, um, <laughs> as for Mr. McDonald's, the, the four million uh, uh, for the, sorry, the, the 
the two million norms and standard for the 9,600, which is about 200 rand, is just for the volumes of my diet, it's for per NGO, not per, in, I just want to make sure that I didn't misunderstand that. And then the additional funding that was received in November, if I'm correct, uh, if my timeline is correct, I just want to make sure, the 51.2 million, that would have been, that is the money received in November last year. And obviously, and the organizations that received the funding for November last year, I think that is the list that we request, and not the ones in the annual financial report, which we know we get in the annual report. Uh, um, are, were they the same organizations that previously got? And I just, like I said, I just want to make sure that I didn't misunderstand anyone and walking away being misinformed by myself. Uh, um, is that the same organization that received the funding in the, from the 53 million rand that was, I think, like around May, or is it new organizations? And that process, the 51 million is now completely closed. And this money it will help organizations, as per the presentation, being distributed now, again, to ensure that it's not for the avoidance of any doubt, it's until the end of this financial year. And then is there a new process starting for the normal financial year, uh, 1st of April, and is there new money available for that? Um, or is this part of general allocations that were just top up from the old funding? I just want to make sure that my understanding is correct. So if somebody asks me that I don't uh, uh, give the wrong information. And the process for the new financial, whether the new funding cycle part of the three-year or is that now completely closed? And so any new NGO, where they were registered three months ago, six months ago, from the new financial year, 1st of April, uh, uh, there is that no opportunity for them to apply because that has been part of a three-year funding cycle as per the earlier presentation? Or is there still an opportunity? And I'm just asking you just to ensure that I am fully, uh, that, that I don't walk away being mis uh, misunderstood what was said. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Member McKenzie. I think Mr. Hale would like to answer you. You may go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable McKenzie, on the PPE, uh, the HOD answered that that uh, money is to NGOs, not to individuals. I've also indicated that the, the, these NGOs received a major support from the Solidarity Fund for PPE be it gloves, sanitizers, and everything they received. This money is only to close the gaps that exist after all the existing support that these organizations have received. It's not to individuals, it's for the organizations to close the gaps on any PPE requirements that they have. And we have requested them to collaborate so that they don't buy as individuals they buy per area to take advantage of the economies of scale. On the funding, uh, Honorable Chair, I did indicate that we have used the combination of new organizations and organizations that were previously funded. The organizations that we funded before only to support the community-based education. Where when we received the 51 million in November, we have also used some of those organizations because they did so well during the first phase. We have also making use of the Western Cape Food Forum. We have identified new organizations that can help us with the distribution of the 51 million to ensure that we've got many organizations so that the service and the delivery can be spread right through the province. If we do so, we are, we, we, we are mindful that we will be cover many, many areas that would not have been covered had we only focused on the funded and, and, and POs. I further indicated that for the community nutrition and development centers, the organization that we fund through a call for proposal, we did not take any new organizations for that part. Of the of the funding, the the closing, the call for proposal. My colleague Liana and the HOD explained that the call for proposal is a three-year cycle. The new cycle, which is going to start now in April 2021, we advertise in June 2020. 
the, the advert ran and closed in September. All the organizations were expected to apply until the end of September. That process, it was for the financial year 20, 21, 22, 20, 22, 23, and 20, 23, 24. That three-year cycle that the, the HOD spoke about. Any organization, whether it was registered three weeks ago, cannot apply for the funding because that process closed. The organizations that we considered now is organization under the emergency situation, COVID-19 disaster situation. Those are the organizations that we, we they, there was no call for proposal. We identify existing organizations, we ad, 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 identify organizations that have a capacity to assist, We've got, we identify organization that has got historic um, experience in providing this service. And we put together a submission for those organizations and those organizations were funded from the 51 million wheel adjustment budget. And the actual money started flowing into the organization now in February, 2021. That money must flow to all these organizations uh, until the end of March. By the end of March, the 51 million ought to have been paid to all the organization, the list that will be provided to the honorable members. But the service doesn't mean that all that 51 million, they must do everything and make sure that the funds are finished by the 31st of March, 2021. The service will continue in the earlier, uh, I'm not sure if it was in this committee, we've indicated that we've got three, three phase intervention. Other interventions are going to run for four months, which means it's February, March, April, May, 2021. Other interventions are going to run for, 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 for six months, which means it will run for six months uh, after the, 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 even beyond the, the new financial year. Other interventions are eight months. So that it means it will run above the, 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 the financial year. So in, in, in summary, Chair, Yes, the funds must be paid in full, the 51 million, to all the organizations that are going to support us, to support us right through into the new financial year. I hope that that makes it very, very clear, Chair, this time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Ewa. I just wanted to maybe add to that as well, that um, the, uh, the, the when when we fund organizations, as I said before, there's always some that may fall fall down and not be able to do what they need to do. Um, and there's others that decide to withdraw from funding arrangements for whatever reason. Uh, those, uh, when we do sometimes have funding gaps. Also, sometimes we receive extra money, uh, usually a quite short notice uh, from the national level um, that uh, then we need to allocate additionally over and above our planned budgets, uh, and then we need to do separate processes um, to to get in additional NGOs. So, so there's always potentially scope for additional organisations to come on board during the course of the year, and between our main three-year funding cycle, advertising and uh, and uh, assessment processes that that Mr. Ewell mentioned, um, and in in those uh, periods uh, we may uh, be getting extra money, or we may have savings, and then we will uh, look to uh, to bring in uh, a couple of additional organisations to, uh, to to address areas where we know we have gaps or shortfalls in services. So uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that there is going to be no other allocations to NGOs between now and the next three years. Um, there, there will be, um, but the, the main um, process has finished. So usually uh, after the beginning of the, the or, or rather after the close of a process like this, uh, there usually isn't any money available immediately. Uh, money usually only becomes available a little bit later. Uh, so, so I think um, you know there's this flexibility in our system and how we work. Um, but we do always try to allocate all of the budget uh, for the year to NGOs up front as far as possible, so that we have our planning sorted out and we know exactly what we're going to be delivering during the year. Um, I hope that assists. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, um, HRD, and thank you very much, Mr. Heu. Um, members, um, that um, concludes the, the questions um, on that. I did earlier indicate that I would give an opportunity to any other guests who would have any questions. I haven't received an indication that anybody would like to ask a question. So with that, I want to say um, thank you very much to the department um, for the, the work that you're doing and for the time that you've taken today to come and engage the committee, to share some of the work that you've done during um, a very difficult time. And thank you very much for always being available. Um, this is the one government department that I know that if I send a WhatsApp message or an email, um, I'm going to get a response. And sometimes that is outside of the normal um, working hours. So we are very grateful. It is disappointing that the South African Social Security Agency could not take some time to brief us and have not been able to give us the information requested as they are the lead department that is supposed to provide during this um, humanitarian crisis. But we do hope that they enjoy their roadshow with the minister today. Um, minister Fernandez and your team, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you may leave the meeting now and the members of the committee will stay on to conclude our administration. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Members. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Honourable Members. Thank you, Chair and Members. Aye. Uh, colleagues, I'm now going to ask um, if there are any um, resolutions or requests for information or any recommendations that you'd like to make, if you could please indicate now. Yes, Chairperson, uh, uh, can I speak? Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Chairperson, yes, I think the department did indicate they're going to give us a list of all the NGOs that receive funding. So what we're looking for is the list of the NGOs that receive funding on the news cycle. That's in November's list. And also the distribution points. And what we'd also like is the funding that they received. Obviously, the, the value of the funding that they received. Uh, so one can, and, and they distribute not only the distribution points, but the actual distribution dates. And that also goes for the list of the ones that receive PPE. Because I'm just trying to get an understanding if 8,900 NGOs receive funding for PPE. It just, I'm trying to understand if 8,900 NGOs receive funding for food distribution, which based on the slide is not the same. And that's part of the reason why I asked my question. So if you can get those lists, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McKenzie. Any other members? Chairperson? Yes, Chair, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, are we going to have, is there, uh, you need to correct me in terms of 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 of, of the letter sent by Baku Baku Force with regarding to the uh, 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 welfare of what you call it the the CPOA welfare homes. I'm not sure. Um, is there any progress or, or? I just need clarity on that. Chair. Thank you. Uh, yes. So in the last meeting, we agreed that we're going to put it on our agenda. So we just need to find the time to, to have that meeting um, and uh, then invite the stakeholders to that meeting. Um, if you remember, we were pressed for time because we wanted to get an update from SASA because we had a lot of problems with people contacting us for the um, lapsing of the temporary disability grant. So that's why today's meeting was scheduled. So what we need to do now is we need to go to the programming authority and ask for a slot to have that meeting. And it will probably not happen in the next um, week because we've got the program full with uh, pre and post SOPA. Um, but that meeting is being scheduled. Um, if I'm correct, we all agree to that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Are there any other recommendations on the presentation that we received today? 
None from my side, Chairperson. Nothing from me, Chair. I Thank you. Okay, members, so what we now also need to agree on is also a, a way forward of how we're going to deal with SASA. Jefferson? Yes, Member Van Kossel. Yeah. Within the uh, metro I, I, side, since we have law of farms and um, rural uh, areas uh, that is practicing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, we, we didn't hear you. Was that you commenting with us, or was it someone else that you were telling that you had lots of money? Because <laughs> we, we could use some of that money for the SASA beneficiaries if you have lots of money. Do you want for me, Tay? <laughs> Look, Tay, no, I was saying, uh -huh. I think I'll have my say after we received the the list of the organizations that the, the department is funding, because I'm more concerned uh, about uh, the rural areas. As we know, the, the rural areas are so vulnerable. Our people are not working. Most people on farms, they are working on season, so they are in need of those food parcels and CNDCs in their area. But if I, 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 I'm following this uh, right, I think a lot of CNTCs are based on in Metro. But uh, I, I will comment after we receive the, the, the list of the CNTCs. Thank you. Thank you, Member Baku Baku. Of course, I also think, members, that what we should do is we should use the numbers on the slide that were given to us and make sure that members of our community know that those numbers, the toll free number, um, 0800 220 250 and the please call me number and the email address that they can use that and that's on slide seven member Mackenzie. Um, member Van Vogel you may continue. Yeah thank you Chair. Chair I think um, in terms of the way forward with SASA uh, no more they must just make uh, between her and, 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 and the department of SASA not the department, Sasa. They just need to, to arrange another meeting because it is important that we meet with them. Uh, and there was no indication that they are saying they are not going to meet with us. As I, as you explained the reason why they could not attend our meeting today. Uh, and it's understandable. Uh, if it happens that they only have one manager of one person who can, I mean, mean like, and have to come and reply to us uh, that's a bit of a problem, but but otherwise, I think the, the way forward is that the Monde must just engage with them and and, and set a date um, and and discuss it with you as the chair. Thanks, chair. Thank you, member Van Vogel. So it's not so much the date; that's the easy thing to reschedule the meeting. It's the the non-response to our request for information. Because if you remember, we met with them on the twenty-first of January. And Mr. Makatuka then indicated that all of the information, including the plans um, that we are asking for, they will be able to, to send that to us, and it shouldn't be a problem to send it to us. So um, if my memory serves, us, serves me right, what we asked for was specifically um, if they could um, give us... Um, the list of doctors in the province and where they are located. Um, they agreed to an update every two or three weeks with regards to where they are with the temporary disability grant application backlogs. Um, the documentation outlining the agreement between SASA and the Department of Health. Um, we also asked for the plan that was developed by SASA to address the problem. Remember they said they've got a 10 point plan and that they were having a meeting the next day with their national team to refine that plan. And we said, can we get a copy of the 10 point plan? And then also we asked for a copy of the report into the, the death at the Sasa office in Grabo. So that information was due on Monday the 8th. And we, Nomonde followed that up with an email to the, to the Sasa prov provincial office, but we've not received anything yet. 
So the one thing that we are doing is we are having a follow-up meeting with them because they did submit an apology for today's meeting saying that they've got other commitments with their ministerial roadshow. But what I'm concerned about is that Sasa seems to show very little regard for, for this committee. And we've built up a very good relationship with Sasa in the province through Mr. De Gra and Mr. Makatuka. Because um, if you remember at the beginning of our term, it was difficult to get Sasa to meet with us and we've, we've managed to work on that. So maybe we need to we need to rely on the muscle we have in this committee in the form of member Baku Baku Force and member Van Fuchel. And maybe they must speak to our National Minister of Social Development to ask her to give us some attention as well. I agree. Yes, please, Chairman. We, we know member Baku Baku Force has a direct line to the minister. <laughs> Maybe it's member Van <laughs> You are the one who's got a direct <laughs> No, no, no. I've, I've seen the minister's public schedule for today. I might just go to one of those events and ask her to come and engage with us. So, members, um, are you in agreement that we will find a date to meet with um, with Sasa? Um, and hopefully by then we would have that information. And we will also schedule a date for the meeting um, to discuss the CPOA issue as per the letter received from Member Baku Baku Force. I agree, Chair. Thank you. Numonde, is there anything else that I'm missing? You have covered everything, Chair. Okay, members, with that, thank you very much for your time um, and for making yourself available. Um, I hope you have a wonderful Thursday, and I will see you all next week um, at SOPA, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much.